I now call to order the Society's 2,372nd meeting in the 146th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by Marty Macquarie. We'll begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2,371st meeting and a brief recounting of the 34th meeting, which took place in 1872. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. And thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and then adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the fall 2016 and spring 2017 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in conjunction with the American Public University, and a donor who has asked to remain anonymous. I'm pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected. Colleen Hartman, an executive at, at NASA, interested in, as you might expect, astrophysics, binary stars, exoplanets, heliophysics, and planetary sciences, including Earth sciences. She comes to PSW through Hubble astronaut John Grunsfeld, who will be our next speaker. Alexander Boyd, a student in mechanical engineering and computer sciences at the University of Rochester, interested in mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, aeronautics, computer sciences, and physics. Alex learned of PSW through his parents, who have been members of the society for quite some time, and Marty Macri, tonight's speaker, whose interests will be clear, I think, from his lecture. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. If any of our new members are here tonight, please see me to pick up your reprint on volume one of the PSW Bulletin, where you can learn something about PSW's founders and why they changed peculiarly to name it the Philosophical Society of Washington, when, in fact, in modern parlance, a name with the word scientific or the like would be more in keeping with their goals. The minutes of the previous meeting's lecture on Juno's exploration of Jupiter by Scott Bolton will now be read by Recording Secretary Preston Thomas. At the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2017, President Larry Milstein called the 2,371st meeting of the Society to order at 8.08 p.m. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. President Milstein presented a summary of the 33rd meeting of the Society held in 1872. The minutes of the previous meeting were read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Scott Bolton, principal investigator on the Juno mission and associate vice president for space science and engineering at the Southwestern Research Institute and senior staff scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His lecture was titled, Juno's Exploration of Jupiter. Dr. Bolton began by explaining that Juno is the second mission under NASA's New Frontiers program. The first was New Horizons' mission to Pluto, which Dr. Alan Stern presented to the Society in April of last year. Dr. Bolton explained that the Juno mission is similarly ambitious, to use Jupiter as a window into the earliest period of the solar system to learn how the planets formed. Dr. Bolton explained that stars form out of nebula, spinning clouds of hydrogen and helium gas. In the nebula that would eventually become our solar system, the formation of our sun captured nearly all this gas. The little material left over formed the gas giant Jupiter. All of the other planets, moons, and asteroids were formed from the leftovers of the leftovers. Dr. Bolton explained that this is why studying Jupiter is so important. Because it formed early and is so massive, Jupiter had sufficient gravity to hold on to the original hydrogen and helium present in the nebula as planets were just forming. As the 1995 Galileo mission atmospheric probe showed, Jupiter is also enriched with heavy elements such as argon, krypton, carbon, and, and oxygen. 
but in a uniformly different ratio than those elements are present in the sun. These data invalidated every then current theory of planet formation and set the stage for a closer investigation of Jupiter in the Juno mission 20 years later. The Juno instrumentation was chosen to examine Jupiter from two fundamental scientific angles. The first is gravity science, with the goal of answering the questions as to whether Jupiter has a rocky core of heavy elements, meaning they were present in the early solar system. The second is water abundance, as measured by Juno's microwave radiometer, which receives in different frequencies to pick up thermal radiation from the different cloud layers as deep as 600 kilometers below the visible surface. This would help map water and ammonia abundances in the atmosphere around the planet and provide clues as to how the planets got their heavy elements. Old theories of water on Earth suggested that it came from comets, but the water in comets we see is of different isotopic ratios than that on Earth, meaning that we need a new theory for Earth's water. Observations about the abundance and isotopic ratios of oxygen in Jupiter can provide a piece of this puzzle. Jupiter's science objectives also included characterizing Jupiter's magnetic field, which is the strongest in the solar system. Dr. Bolton then provided a summary of the findings of the early Juno data. The microwave radiometer data showed that the color bands on Jupiter closely tracked temperature variations, even hundreds of kilometers into the atmosphere. The radiometer data also identified a vast high-pressure geyser of ammonia emerging at the equator from deep in the planet, an unpredicted and as yet unexplained phenomenon. Juno's gravity science package has produced similarly unprecedented findings. The data do not yet indicate whether Jupiter has a solid core, but they have already shown that all existing models for Jupiter's shape, an oblate spheroid, are wrong. Juno's electromagnetic field sensors similarly observed contradictory data about the magnetic field from around Jupiter that has not been fully consistent with any of the models. One potential explanation for the preliminary data may be that, that the magnetic field of Jupiter emanates from far closer to the surface than originally predicted. This could indicate that the layer of metallic hydrogen, which acts as a dynamo to create the planet's magnetic field, is actually closer to the surface than pre previous models predicted. Juno's visible light camera revealed that the poles of Jupiter have none of the familiar orderly colored bands in the shades of red that mark the rest of the planet. Instead, the poles are a mix of transient circular storms in shades of blue, including funnel clouds 80 kilometers tall and half the diameter of the Earth. Dr. Bolton concluded by noting that 400 years ago, Galileo first discovered the moons orbiting Jupiter, working alone with only a crude telescope. Today, the Jupiter mission is collecting a wealth of data about Jupiter, the Juno mission is collecting a wealth of data about Jupiter, and it is being shared freely with the scientific community and amateur astronomers alike, opening the door to still greater discoveries. After the conclusion of the talk, President Milstein invited questions from the audience. One questioner asked about the migration theory, which suggests that Jupiter and other planets may have changed their orbits. Dr. Bolton explained that Juno will provide some insights into the distance from the sun at which Juno formed, but it will not provide definitive evidence that any particular migration model is accurate. <coughs> After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 10.12 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,371st meeting of the Society to the social hour. Temperature, negative 3C. Weather, overcast. Attendance, 161. Respectfully submitted, Preston Thomas, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Preston. Are there any corrections to the minutes or comments on them? If not, I will entertain a motion from a member to accept the minutes. A second to all members in favor? All members opposed? The minutes are approved as read and will be posted to the website in due course. The 34th meeting of the Society was held on Saturday, November 16, 1872. President Joseph Henry was in the chair. The bulletin does not report the time of day the meeting was held or the location. Joseph Henry, as many of you have heard, is, uh, was a primary founder of BSW and is the longest serving president. 
leading the organization from 1871 until his untimely death in 1878. He was the preeminent American physicist of his time, known internationally for his pioneering work on electricity and magnetism, particularly his work on electromagnetic in induction that led directly to the invention of the telegraph and the telephone. He and several close colleagues founded not only PSW, but also a variety of other organizations to support science. Among these are the Smithsonian Institution, which Henry served as first secretary, the National Geographic Society, the Washington Academy of Sciences, and the Cosmos Club, all still active today. Theodore Gill read a paper on the homologies of the shoulder girdle of fishes that was published in Gill's 1872 monograph on the arrangement of the families of fishes, and in 1873 in the Annals and Magazine of Natural History, London. And the bulletin, unfortunately, does not tell us more about this, no doubt. Very, very interesting presentation. Gill was a ichthyologist, mammologist, and malacologist. At an earlier meeting of the society, he had reported on population dynamics of the bluefish. He was a professor of zoology at GWU, served as Smithsonian librarian, and as assistant librarian at the Library of Congress, and was president of AAAS in 1897. Unaccountably, he never served as PSW president. He was an author on over 400 scientific publications in his career, which was quite a large number for scientists of the time. William Harkness wrote a paper on some measurements of heights he made with a pocket aneroid. In case you're wondering, aneroid, the noun, means an aneroid barometer, which isn't much help, is it? Aneroid, the adjective, means relating to or denoting a barometer that measures air pressure by the action of the air in deforming the plastic lid of an evacuated box or chamber. This is an antique aneroid pictured in the slide, perhaps similar to the one that, uh, Hark <clears throat> that was used, presented at this meeting. The bulletin doesn't recount the measurements that he made, nor why he made them with a pocket aneroid. We can guess that he was interested to determine the accuracy of the device. Harkness was a rear admiral and served as director of the Naval Observatory for many years. He served in the Union Army in the Civil War, first as a surgeon, then as an aide at the Naval Observatory, and actually for a time served on the USS Monadnock. He formulated a theory of achromatic lenses, invented a variety of astronomical instruments, and participated in two expeditions to observe transits of Venus, which played a very important role in early calculations of the size of the solar system. He was president of AAAS in 1893 and president of PSW in 1887. He never, never married, lived his entire productive life at the Cosmos Club, which was then located elsewhere. In earlier meetings, he presented papers on the corona of the sun and the spectrum of Enki's comet, which is still an object of study today, and which he called Pond's Comet, because, in fact, it was discovered by Pons, not Enki. Enki was the first to determine its remarkably short orbital period of just 3.3 years around the sun. In a related talk, J.E. Hilgard described the workings of a new type of aneroid built by Goldschmidt. The bulletin does not report anything more about the presentation, except that Hilgard exhibited an example of the instrument. One mechanism used in aneroids is illustrated in this slide, as you may be able to make out, a lever is attached to a diaphragm that holds a vacuum within it. The position of the lever is controlled by the working of atmospheric pressure on the diagram, diaphragm. As the atmospheric pressure changes, the diaphragm expands or contracts, moving the lever arm one way or the other. The opposite end of the lever is attached to a spindle, and the movement of the lever causes the spindle to rotate one way or the other as the pressure changes. Of course, the spindle moves a pointer that indicates by its position on a dial the ambient pressure. Uh, Hilgard was an engineer, did important work in the Coastal Survey, and served as president of the AAAS in 1875. And he contributed frequently to PSW meetings. 
B.F. Craig made a presentation on the water supplies of cities. The bulletin doesn't report the content of his presentation. This particular slide shows a picture of the New York City reservoir of that era that occupied the site currently occupied by the main branch of the New York Public Library and its two lines. The foundations of that reservoir actually now form part of the current foundation of the main library building. And you can see it if you go to the New York Public Library. Craig was a professor of chemistry and physiology in the medical department at Georgetown College, now Georgetown University. Georgetown was founded in 1792 and was given the first federal university charter by Congress in 1815. Craig had made numerous presentations at previous PSW meetings on body temperature and its variation and on apothecary's weights and measures. And with that, we turn from the 34th meeting that took place in 1872 to the 2,372nd meeting <coughs> taking place tonight and to tonight's lecture on medical errors and how to eliminate them. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Marty Macri. Marty is Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. And concurrently, he is Surgeon and Chief of Eyes Transplantation Surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, where he previously held the Mark Ravitch Chair of gastrointestinal surgery. Marty created the surgery checklist popularized in Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto. He is a lead author on the original publications introducing its use and measuring its impact on patient safety. He served on Who's Safe Surgery Saves Lives initiative, which developed the Who Safe Surgery Checklist, and he chaired Who's Technical Work Group on Measuring Surgical Quality Worldwide. His current research and advocacy work focuses on physician-led efforts to reduce waste in the healthcare system. He is an author on more than 200 medical and technical publications. He also is the author of Unaccountable, a book about the healthcare system. He has written for a wide variety of general readership publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Time, and Newsweek. And he is a frequent commentator on health issues on broadcast media, especially programs on CNN and Fox News. Among other honors, Marty was named one of America's 40 smartest people in healthcare by Becker's Review. He attended Bucknell University, Thomas Jefferson University, and Harvard University, earning his undergraduate MD and MPH degrees. And he was a surgical resident here in town at Georgetown University. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming Marty to the podium. Well, uh, thank you, Larry, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. It's been t a tremendous honor to share a podium with the incredible lineage of speakers that you've had here. I've not discovered any planets. I hope that's okay. Um, and, but to uh, be here at the Cosmos Club, it's so exciting. And so thank you, PSW, and thank you, the Cosmos Club. Uh, thank you, Larry, uh, Rob, and all the other new friends I made here tonight. I'm, um, I'm a person that likes to ask questions. So when I first came to the United States um, as a child, I asked a lot of questions. My family is originally from Egypt. And um, Egypt is an interesting place. Generally, they don't believe anything the government tells them in Egypt, and they ask a lot of questions. And actually, that's true in many places around the world. So when I came to the United States, I, I felt very grateful to be here and at the same time had a strong interest in history. Not only because there's tremendous history in Egypt, but also because the history of the United States is deeply threaded in the way of life today. I was blown away by this painting. This is the famous Crossing of the Delaware by Emanuel Lutsky, painted in 1851. But if you remember, Washington did not cross the Delaware in 1851. Washington crossed the Delaware in 1776. So a couple things in this painting are actually inaccurate. For example, Washington probably did not stand on one of the lead boats. The generals were known to stay behind during any charge. There was no ice in the water that night. It simply wasn't that cold on Christmas Eve. They did not have horses on the boats, as you see in boat number two. 
They crossed at two in the morning, so there was no sunlight when they crossed. And they did not have women in the Continental Army, as you see here on the oars, nor did Davy Crockett join the army here <laughs> on the rudder of the first boat. Basically, hardly anything is true here, but is a, it is a deeply inspiring story. It is a deeply inspiring story. And when we talk about health care, there are a lot of inspiring, great stories. But it turns out that there's a lot of things in healthcare that just aren't true. We're learning some of those as new research comes out. As a matter of fact, if there's one theme of the last five years of medical research in the United States, it's that we're rolling back a lot of the recommendations we made 10, 20, 30, and 40 years ago. When I was in medical school, it had just become the law of the land that in medical research, science has now proven that everybody should take a pill. Every healthy person in the world, every adult should be taking a medication once a day, every day of their life. I'm not talking about a multivitamin. I'm talking about research while I was a uh, medical student that showed that everybody should be taking aspirin once a day. Well, research came out a few years ago in an article in the British Medical Journal that showed that you are as likely to die from internal bleeding if you take aspirin once a day as you are to be saved from a heart attack if you have no risk factors for a heart attack. Well, we told the world, we told five billion people you should take a medication. We are now realizing that we need to roll back that recommendation. Mammograms. We recommended mammograms for everybody even when they were young and had no risk factors. Now, there's a controversy because a lot of the science suggests you don't need to start mammographic screening if you have no risk factors for breast cancer until you're 50, but the recommendation has been to start when you're 40. So embroiled in controversy, the Preventive Services Task Force, when they said, hey, you don't really need to start at age 40, there was a backlash. They said, all right, you know what? We're just going to pick 45 because it's in the middle of 40 and 50. We're realizing we are uh, needing to roll back the recommendation on mammograms. PSA testing, um, papillary thyroid cancer, an article just out within the last year that we may not be, need to be doing surgery on papillary thyroid cancer. Three randomized control trials in the last few years in my own field of surgery showing that appendicitis can be treated with antibiotics as long as it's non-ruptured and about 75% of the time, the patient will never need surgery. Only in 25% of the patients that don't improve with the antibiotics or for whom the appendicitis comes back can you do the surgery then. 75% will never need the surgery. Here is one of the most common conditions that result in an operation in the United States. We are now learning we didn't need to be doing a lot of those operations. And the list goes on and on. Vitamin D. Maybe we've been recommending too much vitamin D for people deficient. I don't know anyone that's died of vi low vitamin D. I've never heard of that. We've been recommending everybody get tested, and the age to get tested has gone, gone lower and lower. We're now saying, hey, wait a minute. Have we been overdoing it? Have, we've been, have, have we been over bone DEXA scanning too many people and the national associations have come together in a campaign that has gotten so much consensus it's mind-boggling. 80 professional associations in medicine have signed on to a campaign called Choosing Wisely. 
a public health awareness campaign, both within medicine among doctors and for the public to say, hey, we have been overdoing things every field of medicine, every specialty of doctors comes up with a list of five things done in their specialty that are sometimes overdone. And if you are going to have one of those five things, this campaign is the voice of doctors saying, before you agree to have one of these five things done, choose wisely. Ask questions. Maybe get a second opinion. And we're learning that doctors are as frustrated about the problem as anyone. They're saying, look, we're doing too many of these things. We're doing too much testing before routine surgery in healthy individuals. And we are rolling back those recommendations. Now, it takes a lot to say, I'm sorry. It takes a lot to say, I'm sorry. But if there's something for which I believe my personal opinion, that we as a medical profession should say we are sorry for, it's the dogmatic and strong, solid recommendation we made to tell people what to eat by telling them to avoid fat. If there's one big mea culpa of the last 50 years in healthcare that has had, in my opinion, disastrous consequences for public health, it has been telling people to eat a low-fat diet. Why? Because when we told the world low-fat is healthier, based on terrible science, we moved the entire food industry to a low-fat and processed food market. Low-fat food can only be low-fat if one thing is done to food. And you know what that thing is? You pound it with sugar and carbohydrates. Have you ever wondered why you can have a low-fat, tasty cake? And you're thinking, how is this low-fat? Well, I guess it's good for me. It's low-fat. You have to pound it with substances that are almost like plastics and flavoring and processed ingredients, and look at the ingredients on some of these things of, of food that we think are healthy because the medical community said low fat is healthy, and you look at the ingredients. Well, look carefully. Sugar is the only thing on a nutrition label that does not have a recommended daily allowance to tell you what percent of your recommended daily allowance 20 grams of sugar is. Matter of fact, I felt so much better after reading the science on it, talking to the experts, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. By the way, it's been in the Strayer biochemistry textbook, the standard biochemistry textbook used in most medical schools for decades. It's been in there that sugar raises your insulin level. It stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin. Processed and simple sugars do it faster than the complex natural sugars and fruit, things like fruits. And that high insulin level when the pancreas is reacting to the sugar to produce insulin, that insulin does something in the body. It's a hormone that moves fat into storage. It's not new science. We got it wrong. We got it wrong. Well, it takes a lot to say something like that in any field. I made a mistake with a patient. I ordered a test. It got done on the wrong patient because they had a similar last name. Luckily, it was not an invasive procedure, but it was a big test. They went down for the test, had the test. Now, this patient, this particular patient, was already frustrated at me over something else. I went up to that patient's room and I said, I have to explain something to you that just happened. That test that you got done was not intended for you. It was a mistake. It was my mistake. 
I take responsibility. I'm happy to share with you the results if you want to see them. Well, that patient I thought was going to sue me, that patient looked at me and said with a smile, Doctor, thank you for telling me that. I really appreciate it. And that patient looked at me with a, a new connection and a smile that strengthened our doctor-patient relationship. Why? Because it struck me, people are just hungry for honesty in healthcare. People are just hungry for honesty in healthcare. We've got to ask questions. We've got to ask questions. James Garfield may have been the most popular president ever at the time of an election in US history. Now, Garfield was from Ohio. Everyone loved him. If you know anyone from Ohio, is anyone here from Ohio? Everybody loves people from Ohio. They're wonderful people. And Garfield spoke multiple languages. He connected with immigrant communities in the United States. He himself was a self-made individual, did, worked with his hands, did manual labor, taught at a university, traveled overseas, had a way of connecting with almost everybody. But unfortunately, many of his ideas did not get fully developed during his presidency. Why? Because his idea that blacks in America should have a right to vote and hold prominent roles in society, that women should have a right to vote. Now, he was four presidents after Lincoln, way ahead of his time. The country wasn't quite there yet, but they were kind of okay with these ideas because they liked Garfield. He believed women should hold a prominent role in society and appointed some in his own administration. But two months into his presidency, on 7th Street here in Washington, D.C., where the old railroad station was, a crazy guy, a gentleman with mental illness, shot him at the railroad station, a man named Charles Gateau, a political activist. He was frustrated. He did not get appointed in Garfield's new administration. He wanted to be um, the, um, either Secretary of State or Ambassador to France. Now, Gateau was carried off by the police, and Garfield was taken to an infirmary where two doctors came to the president's bedside. One doctor, Dr. Bliss, said, I recommend we do an operation on the president. The other group of doctors said, no, look, we have Civil War experience. Believe us when we say from our clinical experience that you're more likely to harm the patient in the process of trying to help him with an operation than you are if you just let nature take its course and let the body heal. Well, Dr. Bliss said, if I can't save him, no one can, as he told one reporter eventually sort of pushed aside all the other doctors and asserted himself politically as the head doctor for the president based on the credential that he had been the lead doctor for President Lincoln when Lincoln was shot because he was present when Lincoln was shot. Which, if you know how that went down, that didn't go very well. Well, Dr. Bliss began an expedition over the next several weeks. Seven different times, him and his colleagues inserted their dirty hands and instruments into the president's wound in the back, trying to remove the bullet. They never found the bullet. Alexander Graham Bell, who had been fond of the president, invented a metal detector to try to help the doctors localize the side of the bullet. But Dr. Bliss was certain it was on the side which it ended up not being on. <clears throat> the uh, metal detector never localized the bullet. The doctor was too confident to let him try it on the other side. The president died about two months after being shot. Not from the bullet. The bullet lodged in the subcutaneous fat and uh, it did something called encapsulate or a fibrous protein sheath formed around it. The president died of a wound infection that traversed to the contralateral psoas muscle. 
the president developed an abscess and died of sepsis or a severe infection. Now, the president died of sepsis, but I would submit to you that the president died of a much larger problem, a problem that has not been reduced over time, but a problem that has been magnified over time, and that is the problem of unwarranted clinical variation. Unwarranted clinical variation. The president died of a procedure he didn't need. The president died of medical care gone wrong. <clears throat> the president died essentially of a form of a medical mistake. Now the tragedy was a few years prior, Dr. Lister, a surgeon from the UK, had presented in the United States solid data in 1876 that the use of hand washing and an alcohol-based solution and using sterile technique reduced infection from any invasion of the body with a surgical procedure from almost one in two people dying to about one in seven people dying. Now, if ever, if ever there was a scientific basis for the way we practice surgery, this might have been the birth of it. This might have been the birth of American surgery. The way that we could, for the first time, do operations safely and not have to worry about one in two people dying from sepsis. Now, this was years before President Garfield had his wound treated for by the surgeons without sterile technique. The problem was converting science into practice. It was an implementation problem, not a discovery problem. And today we struggle so much with patients falling through the cracks, diagnostic errors, <clears throat> recently described in one paper to be as common as about one in 10 patients at some point in their lifetime will have a diagnostic error, a diagnosis assigned to them for a condition they do not have. Complications from unnecessary care, overdoses, undertreatment, receiving things that patients shouldn't have because their condition represents normal human variation. Or in other words, the medicalization of ordinary life can result in doing things that don't need to be done. And doing things has consequences. Doing things has consequences. Are we doing too much stuff? Well, if we look collectively at the problem of medical care gone wrong resulting in death, either directly resulting in death or hastening one's death if they have some underlying other problem. Just as someone with cancer could die from a heart attack, so too could someone with heart disease die from a medical mistake that directly causes the death. Now, when we fill out death certificates as doctors, there's a field that asks us what is the cause of death. It turns out, as we learned in doing the research for this article, that that field gets coded by our country to create our national health statistics using the billing code system, what we call the ICD billing code system. Now, we've developed the billing code system not to track medical care gone wrong, not to track overdoses, but instead to track what we can bill for. We've been using the wrong system to measure a problem for which many recent papers have said the problem is not what the 1999 Institute of Medicine report reported it to be when it said that about 50 to 100,000 people die each year from a medical mistake. That, in fact, we learned was based on a 1984 study in part of which one of the lead authors dissented in the 1999 report and wrote a dissenting commentary saying, I think it's larger, I think the problem is bigger. The more recent data suggests that it's not this 100,000 lives per year that are lost due, uh, due to medical error. It may be 
anywhere in the range of 100,000 to 400,000. And we're talking about top articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Health Affairs, the Independent OIG Report, studies that have been cited in the Institute of Medicine and at the National Academy of the Sciences in multiple reports, highly respected studies, but they were not designed to look at dying from medical care gone wrong. When we went back and reviewed the literature, it turns out that it may be that dying from medical care itself might rank as high as 251,000, even if you use a lower estimate of 150,000, it's still much higher than the current leading, third leading cause of death according to our national health statistics because this problem is unmeasured. Medical care gone wrong. Now, I don't know the exact number. In fact, I don't even know the exact number of people that die from heart disease, even though the CDC tells us it's 611. Why? Because I've seen patients die from a medical mistake and on their death certificate, it lists heart failure. Of course, if you die from an overdose and your heart stops, they do CPR, you gotta fill out their death certificate, what do you write? You can't put the true cause, you have to put a billing cause. So as a result, it's, the CDC tells us it's 611,000. Now, I, I was excited to see this article that we wrote in the BMJ became the second most discussed article in all of science last year because it created a conversation about can we do a better job measuring what may be the third largest burden in public health in America, something that has been almost off the map in public health. The most common causes of death in the United States list is a big deal. That informs all of our NIH funding and all of our public health campaigns in the country. Well, there are a lot of people, docs, hospitals, state hospital associations that have great ideas on how to make quality better and how to make care safer but there's not sufficient funding to support their efforts relative to the burden of the problem. <clears throat> President Garfield, I would submit to you, though, died of unnecessary care. Is that problem bigger or smaller today than it was back then? Well, I would submit to you that the proportion of care delivered that's unnecessary <clears throat> is lower, but the magnitude of the problem in whole numbers is much larger. Why? Because we are giving more medications than ever in the history of the world today in the United States. We are doing more procedures than ever in the history of the world today in the United States. We are assigning more diagnoses than ever in the history of the world today in the United States. We have filled out more disability claims today in the United States than ever in the history of the world. We're doing more stuff. Of course, there are more stations for things to go wrong. What about the opinions of doctors? We asked doctors in a national survey. Now, this is data that's not yet published, but I'll share it with you. We asked doctors this question. What percent of medical care within your field is unnecessary? Not you individually delivering unnecessary care, but of the care you see around you, in your opinion, what percent is unnecessary? We got 2,000 doctors from around the United States to answer the question, and guess what they say? About 15 to 30% of all the medications, diagnostic tests, and um, studies that we order are unnecessary. That's their opinion. That's what they believe, according to this study. Now, I have not had any luck getting this um, study published. I've published over 300 scientific articles in my career. Sometimes we even joke around and say, we'll find a journal home for almost anything that we study. Because there are so many journals today. I mean, there are tens of thousands of journals. I cannot find a single journal that is interested in this finding. I, I um, all the reviewers say we don't know the characteristics of the respondents in sufficient detail. Well, I, I think we're listening to somebody say the house is on fire and we want to know on the 911 call who is it that's calling before we send the rescue squad. 
Look at this article that just came out in Consumer Reports. The number one driver of whether or not you get a C-section is no longer the sickness of the baby or the sickness of the mother. It's the presence of which hospital you walk into. That determines more than any other factor whether or not you will end up with a C-section or not. Rates by, the, by hospital with similar acuity can range from 50% to 12%. In Brazil, in private hospitals, the C-section rate is now 90%. Tremendous, unwarranted clinical variation. Well, somebody once told me, you know, I love this area of research. I'm just afraid to go into it because it's so depressing. And I want to talk about the bright side. I want to talk about what people are doing, what doctors are doing, what hospitals are doing, what organizations are doing to address this problem because it's affecting everybody in America in some way. I, it seems like almost everybody has a family member or a friend that has had some form of medical care gone wrong. I've got patients now, when I tell them, you need a CAT scan, they're saying, how much is it gonna be? I've never heard that question before. We're hearing from an empowered generation that is getting clobbered with high deductibles and co-pays. For the first time ever, they are very interested in the cost of things and whether or not they really need things. Why? Because the average deductible in the United States today for a household on the exchange bronze plan is $10,500. The most popular plan on the exchange, the silver plan, it's about $5,000. Most people are starting to realize we are moving in a direction of paying for your own health care yourself. Insurance is getting rele relegated to almost becoming catastrophic insurance. And for the first time ever, we're seeing an empowered generation like we've never seen before outside of the Medicare population. Well, people are asking questions. And the Choosing Wisely campaign was one success story in medicine, engaging 80 specialty associations. I don't know anything that 80 specialty associations in medicine agree on, except for maybe increasing doctor pay for Medicare. There's tremendous agreement now for us to do something about this problem and maybe to say, mea culpa, we got something wrong. We need to change the way we do the business. Now, healthcare is the only business where you can walk in as a patient, have no idea what something costs, ask the question, and if somebody asked their doctor, hey, before you do this operation, how much does it cost? You know what the most common answer is? I don't know. If you ask an anesthesiologist doing your operation, now, are you in network? Because the hospital and my surgeon are in network, but are you as the anesthesiologist in network? You know what the most common answer you're going to get? I don't know. Now, imagine we had a supermarket where people would walk in and have no idea what the prices are on any products, and you go to put something on the register counter, and they ring it up, and they say, this orange is $500. And you say, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. Then I don't want it. Put it back. And they say, too late. Once we ring it up and you see the price, you can't return it. Okay, that's the way healthcare works. We have a dysfunctional, dark, and, and sometimes ill-transparent marketplace. We have an ill-transparent price marketplace and sometimes an ill-transparent quality marketplace. And that's why I decided to take on this area of research and study the problem. Now, we just looked at what we call markups in healthcare. There's a game that goes on where the prices of services get marked up two, three, four, even five times what Medicare would actually pay for the service. But in network insurance members get a discount. The discount may be 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. And the markups have been historically going up, and the discounts go up. And what we've done is we've created both the boogeyman and the solution. We've created the firefighter and the arsenic. What's the solution if you're out of network and you get clobbered with the bill that's five times what Medicare would pay? The solution is, oh, you should have joined the network. 
We're creating the solution and the problem together. If we had fair and transparent prices in America, we wouldn't have networks. There wouldn't be a need for networks. And that's what many people are starting to call for right now. I want to talk to you about improving wisely. Now, Improving Wisely is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which also funded Choosing Wisely. But Improving Wisely is different because Improving Wisely goes to the physician organizations and says, tell us of a metric of overuse in your specialty that you believe is valid. And we'll pull it out of the claims data and show everybody where they stand. Now take, for example, skin cancer. Now, there's something called Mohs surgery, where you can remove a skin cancer by cutting around it, looking at the edges of the block that you remove, and seeing if there's cancer at the edges under the microscope. Now, both the surgeon looks at, does the cutting and looks at the slide themselves, and it's a very elegant surgery. They can do, uh, make very creative cuts, and they're able to preserve as much healthy tissue as possible, and yet maximize the tumor-free resection rate. Now, it's, I've always been impressed at this area of surgery. It's technologically impressive. They do this during the operation. Now, I did not know, even as a surgical oncologist, that payers in Medicare pay per cut. So when we went to the American Academy of Mohs Surgeons and asked them, what's the metric that would be useful to look at, they said, the number of cuts by surgeon for a standardized lesion. And guess what we found in the data? The national average is 1.6 cuts for a surgeon in a year for a standardized lesion. But some are doing three, four, even more average in, it in the course of a year. And Almost as concerning, they tell us, are the number of people making only one cut on average. Now, if you had see hundreds of patients and on your average number of cuts is one, then those cuts cannot possibly uh, have a rate of zero cancer at the margin unless the cuts are wider than they need to be. Well, that's what the surgeons tell us. We don't decide the metric. We leave it up to the practicing, busy clinicians who are leaders and experts in their field. Why? Because I personally believe as a doctor that operates two, three times a week that there is enough wisdom that lives within the doctor community in medicine that we can fix our own house and we can use some of that expertise to clean up a lot of the waste in healthcare, the waste that burdens every family in America, almost every business in America in some way. How about cardiac catheterizations? Now, this is also called an angiogram when you go in and um, as a patient and there's some question of a potential heart blockage based on any one of a number of factors. The doctor will go in and puncture the artery, insert a wire with a little tube that goes over top, and then inject some dye and will look at the screen and identify whether or not there's a blockage or narrowing in one of the coronary arteries. Well, recognizing there have been studies that suggest a small fraction of cardiologists may be putting in too many stents, we decided to look at the proportion on the request of the cardiologists, the proportion of these caths where a stent is placed. And it turns out that nationally, the average is about 10 to 20% of all caths will involve a stent. But some are putting in stents in over half of the casts that they're doing. Maybe these doctors are the, getting the high-risk cases referred to them, and that may be the case. We're letting the specialists decide what is considered a reasonable boundary of appropriateness, something we haven't really talked about much in healthcare. We talk about when to do things. We don't necessarily talk about when not to do them with the same vigor that we teach when to do things in medical school. It turns out that, interestingly, about a fifth of doctors that do cardiac catheters at some point in the course of a year will almost never put in a stent. We learned that there's a field of cardiology 
called diagnostic cardiac caths, where the doctor is just looking, but if they see a blockage, they don't put a stent. Why? Maybe their skills um, are not adequate. Maybe they didn't train in putting a stent. Maybe they don't feel comfortable. Maybe it, it's a hard one and it needs to go to someone else. But it turns out there's a number of cardiac caths where the person who does the cath will never put a stent in. Why? They're diagnostic only. So we went back to the cardiologist and said, hey, what is it with this diagnostic only? They said, yeah, some people will do the cath but not put the stent in. And they'll refer it to somebody who can put the stent in. Well, of course, we asked, is this ethical? And they said, well, remember, historically, if you had a blockage, you, you just went to heart surgery. There was no stents to even put in there. And the practice has lingered. So we've realized that there's different opinions out there. But when we talk to a cardiology nurse, they say, yes, it's unethical. Yes, it's two do, uh, die loads. Yes, it's two procedures. It's the cost of two procedures. It's two doses of radiation, and it's two punctures in an artery. That's not right. That's not right. Well, what I know is that when you feed honest data back to people, what you can do is encourage outliers to do the right thing and potentially refer cases that could have, uh, uh, where you could have a doctor who can place a stent uh, rather than have a diagnostic only catheter procedure. Why would anyone agree to have a diagnostic only catheter if you could have the same procedure done by a cardiologist that can place the stent and do the diagnosis? This is the problem of unwarranted clinical variation. It's a problem not only that harms people, but it's a problem that is costly. And as we talk about how to lower health care costs, as we talk about crushing insurance premiums, this is the project that we're hoping will help reduce health care costs in the United States by finally addressing that issue of appropriateness with some form of big data. Now imagine you're on an airline, and pick your airline. I kind of like Delta, so I'm picking Delta here. And imagine you have a rude flight attendant. I know it's a stretch of an imagination here, but imagine that someone treats you very poorly. And imagine they consistently, that individual is an outlier in the airline. They treat all their customers poorly. If you go to that flight attendant and say, Delta Airlines is below the mean nationally as an airline in customer service scores, is that going to have an impact on their behavior? It's not actionable data, right? It's, well, I have a different situation. I have a difficult group of customers. Uh, it's the other flight attendants that are uh, driving our scores down. It's not actionable, right? And yet we do this in healthcare all the time. We tell people, your hospital rate of infections or, or blood clots is worse than the national average. And we expect the docs to change the way things are done. If you could develop an actionable metric that appropriately adjusts for the complexity of the cases, you could have a situation where somebody presents data that, to that flight attendant and says, you are in the outer two percentile within the airline on your customer satisfaction scores as an individual. Do you think that data is actionable? Absolutely. Why? Because it's individual. It's specific. In healthcare, if you told someone your hospital rate of complications is tenfold higher than the average after risk adjustment, the answer is my patients are sicker. How do they collect the data? This can't be true. But if you say, hey, this doctor's, you as a doctor, and I believe in sharing this information confidentially and civilly with the doctor, your rate is tenfold higher. That is actionable data. When the, when the Wall Street Journal reported Optim, um, ophthalmologists that use Avastin inappropriately. When they reported Florida oncologists that give Epigen, a controversial medication for solid tumors, for which there's a lot of discretion. When they reported the extreme outliers 
Guess what happened to those outliers after they were notified that they were in the outer one percentile? They regressed towards the mean. This is the power of data when used appropriately. Well, a lot of exciting things are happening. People are demanding prices and some hospitals are providing them. This is one hospital website in Oklahoma where the hospital says, look, you can and should know the price. Click on a part of the body and we will tell you what the price is. And it includes everything, parts and labor for 30 years. There's a company overseas that's sort of the hotels.com of healthcare. They're not in the United States yet, but I've advised this company. They provide services that are fixed and fair and transparent. Now, if a doctor is the best and he wants to charge double, he can do that. You can post any price you want, but the marketplace is a competitive, fair, honest marketplace. The market is competent, which is probably why healthcare costs are lower in some of these countries. It is a competent marketplace. Now, can we have this in the United States? That's the direction we're moving. Listen to this report on the evening There is news. a new way to combat the skyrocketing cost of doctor's bills, and it's easy as a few clicks on the computer. A startup that is saving thousands of people by letting them browse for medical services the same way you might look for a bargain airplane ticket online. NBC's Olivia Stearns has more in our series, The Price You Pay. And that's one startup company. There's several of these coming up that are providing clear and transparent prices. And if you noticed in the last election, presidential election, both candidates from both parties were talking about fair, honest, and transparent prices so consumers can make a decision. Why? Because that's what the American people want, and they're responding to that new public demand with high premiums and high deductibles. Davy Shetty, a surgeon in India, is doing heart surgery for a couple hundred dollars. His outcomes are as good as the Cleveland Clinic for routine heart surgery for a couple hundred dollars. Why? They've asked him, and there's a review in the Harvard Business Review on Devi Shetty. Because sometimes, he says, patients heal better with fresh air and the support of their family than they do from bandages and air conditioning. This may be the future. Maybe we can learn what the doctor said when they advised Dr. Bliss at Garfield's bedside, sometimes you're more likely to harm the patient in the process of doing too much than if you let the body heal naturally. Big, big study just came out on multivitamins, asking the question, should every American be on a multivitamin? Published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of their most highly viewed articles in the history of the journal showed there was no benefit to a multivitamin if you're otherwise living a healthy life. That's useful information. Less can be more. Now, there's a problem of undertreatment as well as overtreatment. I don't want to oversimplify the art of medicine. It's a craft that we take seriously. But patients don't want to come in and wait in the waiting room anymore. They want to talk to their doctor instantly. They want to know what the prices are, and they want an efficient marketplace. This is the new generation of young folks. They don't want to own a car. They want to take Uber or Lyft. Why? Because when you own a car, you have to get an oil change every three months, and you have to get insurance, and you have to deal with accidents, and you have to um, um, maintain your car, and it depreciates worse than any other investment in the face of the planet. They're looking at us, and they're saying, why would anyone want to own a car? They want things on demand. It's a new generation. That generation is changing healthcare, both as medical students and as consumers. There are smart tools that are being adopted. When I was privileged to be a part of creating the surgery checklist in my department, and I took the checklist in the operating rooms asking my colleagues to participate, it was a moment I did not realize would go down in history. This checklist was adopted by the World Health Organization after I published the first few articles on our experience at Johns Hopkins. The checklist now hangs in the operating rooms of almost every hospital around the world. A simple intervention to add civility to the teamwork of medicine by asking, what are the names and roles of the members of the team? What are we doing? 
and what are your concerns? Creating an honest conversation around healthcare. That's the way medicine had always, has always been delivered. That's the medicine that Halstead and Osler and Kelly and, and Welsh practiced when they would walk around together and see patients in the historic Johns Hopkins Hospital. They saw patients off the circular atrium of this building, where, which is where we get the term rounds from, making hospital rounds. Doctors were signers of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Their ideas ranged from starting state medical boards to creating common issues in society. How many people in America agree on political issues? What if I told you those issues were being against corruption, being against waste? I bet you there's 99% consensus in the United States. But sometimes the echo chambers of media would polarize us instead of bring us to, bringing us together over issues that we all find common to humanity. Well, that's what I have. I want to thank all of you for coming here. I've written about these issues in the book Unaccountable, and most recently, a personal journey in the story Mama Maggie about my aunt who works with street children in Cairo. I want to thank you for your time and coming out to hear me, and happy to chat questions. Thank you, Larry. So we have time for questions, and there are uh, one, two, three, three. Uh, there are two microphones, so keep your hand up in the air long enough for us to see you, and the microphone will eventually come to you. And when it does, please stand up, tell us your name, tell My us name? if you're a member of the society or you're not. My name is Al Ehrlich. I'm a member of the society. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any idea or any opinion as to how much risk of being sued induces what 90% of physicians would say is an unnecessary test. In other words, you protect yourself by covering all bases. It's a great question. Um, we asked doctors in our national survey, what drives a lot of the unnecessary medical care? And one of the top answers was fear of malpractice. Now, fear of malpractice ranges by the specialty. The OBGYN doctors, some of the neurosurgeons, they're getting clobbered with malpractice premiums. In other fields, it is not that high, but some malpractice premiums are as low as $8,000 a year. So it depends on the specialty, but in a broad analysis by health policy experts, including several at Harvard, medical malpractice is a added cost in healthcare, but it is not the leading driver. Remember, you can also lower costs because of fear of malpractice. Some doctors can turn down high-risk cases for fear that it could turn into a, a complication could develop. There's a question in the back. Robin? My name is Bruce Murray. I'm not yet a member, but I did apply tonight. Um, I had a... a <clears throat> I've had a couple um, procedures since I've uh, retired, and in one of them I had a, a, a bill for $37,000 for a, a shoulder repair, you know, for um, a rotator cuff repair. But the doctor himself who performed the surgery maybe got about $1,000, and I wasn't in the hospital overnight, I believe, with this. I, um, I, questioned the doctor about this, and he said, a lot of this is due to the fact that hospitals are, have um, sort of bargaining strength that individual doctors don't have in our system. And I thought that was a very interesting statement, particularly since these hospitals are being consolidated into these uh, you know, large health organizations that are you know, probably limiting the competition in a way for these costs. I wonder if you feel that may have something to do with things. Bruce, right? Yes. Bruce, next time that happens, go to Healthcare Blue Book and look up the Blue Book price of that. It's a new company, and it's one of the many startup companies that I think are going to help save healthcare. It'll offer a reference-based price, 
Fair Health offers something similar, so does um, clearhealthcosts.com. There are these sites that are telling um, consumers, this is what Medicare would pay for that service. By the way, doctors can't negotiate with Medicare. They just take that bill. If they don't want to take Medicare patients, fine. But most do, so, so it's implied that they, you would think they still find it profitable if, if uh, they take Medicare prices. So um, Medicare is a very controversial subject, but I'll tell you this. The average bill that goes directly to a consumer outside of Medicare is probably two or three times higher than what Medicare would ever pay. Some states are passing laws. New York and California have both considered laws that said, hospitals, you can't shake a patient down and price gouge them for more than your highest payer, insurance payer, would pay for the same service. And this is a new battle that's taking place in the United States. And I think um, transparent pricing would address a lot of that. Uh, you spoke about the, uh, Preston Thomas. Uh, I'm a member and also the recording secretary. That's just why I was typing the whole time. Um, you spoke about the next generation of patients and doctors being uh, sort of the, the drivers of this. You spoke a lot about the patient's role. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit about the next generation of doctors. Um, pretty much, if you could make a change in med school right now to push this forward, what would that be? Well, it's interesting. The new generation of students are very different from us. They have very little tolerance for BS. They expe expect everything on demand. They want excellence and everything, and they have very, um, they demand transparency, not only from government and the White House, they expect it in every industry. And so we're seeing a generation of doctors that I think are being more real with patients. I think medical students are attracting Patient, uh, doc, uh, medical students that are more diverse, and we're starting to say, hey, why is it that all of the studies on heart disease up to a certain point were all done on older white men? What happens if this is just the normal variation of ethnic variation that we're seeing in other patients that are being deemed as having disease? We're seeing physical therapists and people that believe in holistic care are coming to our medical schools. So it's a whole new era. You know, if you get shot in the heart and you need that hole repaired with emergency cardiac surgery, you want to be in Washington, D.C. or Baltimore or Philadelphia or in Boston, downtown. We can do that repair better or faster than any place in the world, and our healthcare system at its best is the envy of the world. But come in with chronic pain and see what kind of answer you'll get when we can't figure it out. Um, there, we we underappreciate alternative therapies. You may um, learn that Eastern medicine has more experience than some of our Western uh, treatments for chronic pain. So there's a lot of honesty that we need to tell patients uh, we don't know. I don't know. And talk to another doctor. They may know. I just don't know. We need to stop saying it is not known and start saying I don't know. I think we have one up here. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a member. I noticed a separate item on your checklist for antibiotics, and I wonder what's happening there. Yeah, so we had a compliance problem where we knew surgery was safer if we gave antibiotics within an hour of the incision, and we weren't doing a good job. And the reason is that it's a big process. Someone has to order it from pharmacy. It has to be delivered. It has to be given to an anesthesiologist or nurse. They have to hang it. They have to be able to time it when you're going to make the incision. And, and that process was basically terrible in a lot of places in the United States. Now, some surgery centers and some team-based practices where there were dedicated teams had it down. But we needed better teamwork in some of the bigger centers where there was a lot of new people, especially a lot of training centers. So by standardizing it on a checklist, compliance improved, and that's probably why 
there was a 50% reduction in complications in one study with the checklist, with the use of the checklist. In, this, in the year the checklist was implemented, it was estimated that the checklist resulted in more lives saved than the newest chemotherapy that was released that same year. And I think sometimes it's a matter of doing the right thing rather than discovering the, tr the cure. There's one in the back there. I'm Terry Layton, I'm a member. Um, I have so many questions, I don't know which one to ask. But um, I guess one of them, uh, based on my own experience here in DC, um, <laughs> is that, well first let me say, I've had surgery in India, Colorado where I lived a long time, and here in DC, and other medical care. DC is the only place where I'm terrified to go talk to a doctor. I go in in a defensive mode because I feel greed is the number one driver and I have to deal with incompetence and dishonesty. 28 years in Colorado, I never felt that way one time. So I know you just praise DC and Baltimore, but um, I wonder if from a different measure, medical care varies geographically and if it isn't away from the medical schools in the big cities with a high, high rate of living, um, that you do, do you get better care there in general, where there isn't this driver of greed? I know I sound very negative, but I've had seven surgeries in the past three years, and now I'm terrified to retire here because of the medical care. Well, so I'm just wondering what your opinion is as far as geographic variation. Honesty, competence, and more of a general care about the patient instead of making the money that comes from these things. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your experience. It makes me very sad because medicine is an amazing profession. It is the best job in the world, and when the craft is performed properly and patients are treated with dignity, it can develop the most positive experience and the tightest bond you can ever have between two individuals, and it's beautiful when it works well. And unfortunately, when you throw big dollars into this art form and the stakes are high, some fraction of folks, and I believe most doctors try to do the right thing every time. But some fraction will respond to the perverse incentives. And we've all seen tragic cases where patients suffered and even died unnecessarily because of one of these perverse incentives or a lack of knowledge or what I would describe a lack of humility. How do you teach that? How do you teach humility to a student? We get the most bright, creative, energetic, mission-minded human beings in the world come to our medical school and then on their first day they are so energetic it's inspiring. And then over the course of four years of learning a new vocabulary and being introduced to a new ethical system and a new language and a new um, way of doing things and incredible hours and pressure and some post-traumatic stress disorder that is unrecognized and untreated. Okay, I spoke with a uh, physician recently who described someone who died because of a, something they saw from beginning to end, they could tell was not right, and they knew it, and there was no way to really talk about it, and they watched someone, they're still living with that. How do you teach humility? How do you teach, I don't know, maybe, this the other doctor might know. Or that's my opinion, but go get a second opinion. Um, we shouldn't be like other professions where you work out of your space, okay? If you want to buy real estate in a certain part of town and the agent has never sold in that town and doesn't know anything about it, but their partner real estate agent does and sells everything there and knows that area cold, they should say, if you really want that area, my partner is better. But they may wing it. And in medicine, we should never wing it. We should be honest with patients. How do you teach humility? It's tough. And I think that's the key 
to, to great health care. Hello, David Rosen, lifetime member. Um, we were, I was at a talk here just a few, year, uh, a, a few months or years ago where the, where the speaker told us some horror stories about vitamin D deficiency and how it, 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 it hit dark-skinned people more than light-skinned people. So I have to ask, when you said that nobody has to take vitamin D, these studies that showed that we really don't need vitamin D supplements, was that all done on white males? Second of all, second of all, I know a lot of homeopathic physicians and people who believe that vaccines cause autism, and they would say the answer is simply avoid the medical profession altogether, and then we can avoid and then we can avoid ac uh, uh, accidental proce uh, procedures. Now, is that the answer? Should we just uh, uh, avoid medicine altogether to avoid, to avoid uh, medical mistakes? I, I would say no. I've seen med medicine work miracles, save lives, and pull families out of the worst and most anxious times of crisis. But when somebody is told you need this, and you've got the time to do research, do your research. 20% of second opinions are different from the first opinion. Doctors believe a third of the tests and procedures we do are not even necessary. There's this national movement to develop a list for public awareness of things that if you're told you need to have done, think twice. So recognize that when you have the luxury of time Another doctor may say, you don't need this medication, you can do something else instead. Still to this day, most doctors, when an obese patient walks in, will say, try to avoid fat. We still have a low-fat diet brochure on our cardiac unit when patients leave after heart surgery. I mean, we need to start saying, we think and not we know when the evidence does not support it. And I think you can do a lot of research on your own. The easiest thing to do is to get another opinion. Your question about, about vitamin D? Yeah. I've never seen a patient die of vitamin D deficiency. Seen people break bones with let, me, let me clarify. Under 65 years of age and without renal failure. Now, if you're over 65 or you have renal insufficiency, bone scanning can be indicated, and your vitamin D level may contribute. But I've never met an he otherwise healthy individual who eats a regular diet who naturally has a vitamin D level that's dangerously low. I, I consider myself pretty healthy. I went in to see my doc, and they checked my vitamin D level, and guess what? It's low. I feel fine. I feel great. Take this vitamin D. I took vitamin D. Still low. Take more. Still low. Take a mega dose. So they said, take a mega dose instead of the normal units, orders of magnitude higher. Guess what? My vitamin D level is normally low. And I think we're recognizing with a lot of things in healthcare, there has been some overdiagnosing. And, you know, it's very, del this subject is very delicate. Why? Because there's going to be somebody somewhere that, um, really does have a breast cancer and a mammogram at age 50 is, or age 40 is going to be helpful. But when we look at the population, and they did this, mammogram starting at 40, mammogram starting at 50, years, many years later, no difference in death rates. Now, does that mean that no one between 40 and 50 had breast cancer? No. It just means that if they caught it between 40 and 50, it was probably not the kind that was going to catch, kill them, or they would have discovered it some other way, or it would have become palpable, or it was cu the curable type. So these studies all have to be interpreted in context, and I do personally think that with vaccines, that a lot of kids have suffered because of uh, um, P 
people not looking at the science on vaccines. So I think that the vaccine science is solid. And I think vaccines are safe. Maybe the schedule could be a little different. Um, it's, it's hard to do studies on kids and see what their antibody response is. You don't want to be sticking needles in little babies all the time just to check an antibody level. So it's hard to do the research. But I do think this fear that vaccines could cause autism, so therefore let's not do vaccines, has probably resulted in the measles outbreak two years ago. Yeah. Hi. Last question. Well, go ahead. you go ahead and then they'll, they'll be... Doug Curry, member, had a question on uh, blood tests. And my understanding is that the high and low have nothing to do with health. It has only to do with the population. Is that true? Yeah, every test is different. So for, uh, let me give you another example. My white blood cell count is, the normal range is five, is five to 10. And if you're in that range, they say you're normal. If, you, if it's below five, they say you're leukopenic or you're neutropenic. If you're high, then you have a sign of infection. That's a sign of an infection. Okay, that's in the books. That's even in the, when you get a lab test, it says normal range, okay? My white blood cell count is two. Now, I've been tested a million different times. Every way, almost every year, it's normal. That's normal. I feel great. That's normal. The reality is that this guy might be seven, this person may be five, this, that person may be eight, that person may be nine, and maybe that's the bell curve, but you, there can be normal ranges outside without any consequences. So how do we get these ranges? Well, we study limited populations, right? Do we really know what the real range is in Zimbabwe of that part? Do we know what the range is among Pima Indians? Do we know what the range is among people that live in the Hunan province. These ranges are sometimes the medicalization of ordinary life. And I think what we need to remember and what I teach every one of my medical students at Johns Hopkins is that you need to treat the patient, not the test. Lloyd? Hi, Lloyd Mitchell, I'm a member. Uh, I'd just like to point out that there's some evidence that shows that in uh, minority populations that preeclampsia is associated with low vitamin D levels. And uh, then I have a question, uh, and that is, <clears throat> you know, we have, you showed, talked about a large range of prices and variety of uh, costs in this country, and it seems a lot of that's driven by the private health insurance, which is driven by profit motive, and how does our system compare to other countries that have single-payer systems, do they have those kind of inequalities or inequities with prices? I'm sure that doesn't get to the quality of the service, but. Easy, quick question to end it off with here. Uh, um, good, it's, a good, it's a good question. Every system has its own perverse incentive. And I think even though um, some systems are more efficient than others, every, even the VA hospital system here Try to get an MRI at the VA hospital on an inpatient. Okay, it's killer. It's impossible to get. I've been there. Why? Because the incentive to do things is very low. Okay, try to get an MRI when the physicians own the MRI practice and, and building and, and very easy. So there's... Every system has its own perverse incentive. And I think that people sometimes get so, react so much to one of the, you know, problems of a system and want to go to one extreme. The reality is that I think um, we have a free market system, but it's ill-transparent. It's dark. It's blind. You have no idea what you're walking into when you walk into a hospital. Do you know if the surgeon that comes down to see you has never done that case before? Is there any public record of their complications or their practice patterns or the fact that they may do the procedure entirely by cutting people wide open when it could be done laparoscopically? No. Do you have any idea what the cost is? No. Do you have any idea if the person who's gonna take care of the newborn baby 
after preeclampsia is in network or out of network? That neonatologist that's on call for the group that services this hospital? No. So you have a, a free market marketplace, but in my opinion, the competition is at the wrong level. The competition is at the level of marketing and billboards and valet parking. It should be at the level of the value of the base of the healthcare. And I think that's what people are calling for right now. It's probably the most feasible system we can transition into um, because the reality is healthcare is messy and, and you can't just turn things, you know, just, uh, turn the ship overnight. I think we're moving towards a value based healthcare system. Without having any personal opinions on it, I think, you know, we need to make the most of, of the system that we're going to be in. We're looking at bundled payments. You know, that's a big issue right now. Um, but I mean, th this is the conversation we talked about in the classroom and in academics for decades. For the first time ever, we're actually seeing the real world play out of it. You know, Medicare, um, private insurance, and people paying out of pocket. So. I think we're going to see an increase in health savings accounts, and um, we're going to see deductibles and co-pays continue to burden people. Thank you. Very interesting lecture. <laughs> so before you go, I want to present you with a small token of appreciation Thank for you, coming Dr. here and spending time with us and for your lecture. A framed copy of the announcement of your lecture signed by the members of the general committee on behalf of the membership. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, okay. sit down for a few minutes. So before we go, we have a few closing announcements. Which I promise to be quick. BSW depends on its membership. Uh, please join if you're not a member. And if you are, uh, please get involved. And you can apply for membership on the PSW website here www.pswscience.org. All you have to do is, uh, where is it? Oh, membership. If you push the membership button, imagine this. The application for membership will appear magically on your screen, provided you still have your internet connection and your computer hasn't crashed. If you just fill out this form and answer all the mandatory questions, uh, you'll get to the bottom where it requires you to submit a dues payment. And when you push this little button, a screen will come up, which I should really put up here, but I haven't done that yet because I don't want to have to pay the extra $75. And it will give you choices for paying. And the default choice, because PayPal is our merchant bank that just processes these payments, and we use them because they're very inexpensive and kind to charitable organizations, is only the default. You don't have to use PayPal. There's a tab. Pick credit card or debit card and put in your usual credit card or debit card information and it should go right through. If you want to donate, and you're like a if you want to donate, just give me the money in cash. <laughs> Robin, yes, it's, it's the dudes tab. Okay, we should probably change that to dues and contributions. If you have any questions about membership, uh, please see Robin Taylor, our uh, corresponding secretary, or me, or our treasurer, John Ingersoll, over there, and they'll be happy to answer any questions you have. PSW is a nonprofit educational organization, and under the current rules of the Internal Revenue Code, it qualifies uh, as uh, your contribution qualifies as tax deductible. Uh, for those of you who don't know, PSW has a meetup group. PSW Science is the largest general science meetup group in the D.C. area, and we have, as of now, over 1,000 members, and we're still growing. Uh, while the meetup page has only a portion of the information on the PSW website, it's worth noting because it's another way to connect with people in the area who are interested in science. But remember, joining the meetup group does not make you a member of the society. Our next lecture will be the 2,373rd meeting of the Society on February 10th, 2017, right here in the Powell Auditorium. And the speaker will be our favorite astronaut, John M. Grunsfeld. He's also the former Associate Administrator of the Science Mission Directorate of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And his lecture will be on, after the James Webb Telescope, in space assembly of very large space-based observatories. We hope to see you then for what promises to be a very informative lecture. 
Oh, go on the website. <laughs> it's two weeks. Oh, I forgot to change it. Sorry. I think it's two weeks from today. Maybe it's on this one. February 10th. Okay? Thank you for pointing that out because I probably would miss it next time and then I'll repeat it three times. Anyway, the speaker for the 2374th lecture on February 24th will be Brett Alexander, who is the Vice President at Blue Origin, and he will be speaking on the new space age, specifically on new rocket engines and launch systems being developed by companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX and by NASA. Speaker on March 10th will be, we hope, Frederick Hybert, an archaeologist with National Geographic, and we hope they'll be speaking on archaeology of the Near East. Speaker on the 24th, the 2376th meeting will be Reed Beeman, who is a program director with the National Science Foundation. And he'll be speaking on a very interesting subject, which is biological collections. They're study by instruments. The collection of information from those studies and about the specimens in a digital form and providing digital access to them on a much broader basis than presently um, is, is available. Speaker on April 7th, our 2377th meeting will be Eric Lindstrom, and he is program scientist, physical oceanography at NASA, and he will be speaking on understanding oceans and ocean dynamics using remote sensing satellites. For all of you aficionados of climate, this will be a good a good lecture for you, because it will be about some of the ways that we actually collect meaningful data about climate and how we analyze it. On the 28th, the speaker will be Anthony James, a professor, mosquito expert and molecular biologist at UC Irvine, and he will be speaking on mosquitoes, synthetic biology, CRISPR, gene drive, and malaria. And that's going to be a very interesting talk. Please keep checking the PSW website, for updates, did you have a question? I just wanted to ask, is this intended to be every other week Yeah, it's pretty much every other week okay. for the academic okay. semesters. Sometimes it's sometimes there are three weeks apart. Oh, oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, they're not not exactly every two weeks. Okay. If you really want to know, it's sixteen a year at the moment. So it's eight in the spring and eight in the fall semester. And so they're not, and we don't meet in the summer. So, okay, so please check the website for updates to the schedule, www.pswscience.org. The social hour ends at 10.30, after which PSW members and guests meet at the Fairfax Hotel Lounge across Massachusetts Avenue and get rollickingly happy to continue the discussion. Uh, if you want to join us and you've never been before, please see corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor or myself uh, or Vice President Lloyd Mitchell. With that, I will accept a motion to adjourn the 2,371st meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. Do I have a second? All in favor? All opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Social Hour.